Thank you. Welcome to tonight's Start in Your Yard presentation, a program of Northern Kane County Wild Ones. I'm Roland Lauer, current treasurer of Northern Kane County Wild Ones. I've had native plantings in my yard since 1996 and can't imagine my yard now without all the year round visual interest and wildlife it attracts. Next slide. I would like to thank Gail Borden Library for hosting these events. We couldn't do it without them. Wild Ones is a, nas is a national uh, organization. It's a non-for-profit advocacy group committed to promoting the use of native plants in landscaping, gardening, and land restoration. Next slide. Our Start in the Yard program and community read program is built around Dr. Doug Tallamy's latest book, Nature's Best Hope. This book lays out a path for each of us to improve our neighborhoods by planting native plants in our yards. Dr. Tallamy is a professor of entomology at University of Delaware and has written several books linking the health of humans on our planet to the health of pollinators and the native vegetation that supports them. His book and this series provide information about how to use native plants in any type of yard and the benefits to ourselves and our neighborhood by doing so. I encourage you to visit the startinyouryard.com website for more information about where to get the book if you don't already have it and to watch the Tallamy presentation that he gave here in Elgin last year. Also here, you'll find a link to Northern Kane County Wild Ones for more information about their programs and native plant sales. Next slide. The Northern Kane County Wild Ones meets throughout the year in Elgin. We host programs monthly, usually the last Thursday of the month with various speakers. And we also host tours of native gardens. Here are a few of our upcoming meeting dates and topics. There's one coming up next week. Next slide. We also host an annual plant sale where you can buy native plants and shrubs at a very reasonable price. If you have any questions, you can contact us at the email that's at the bottom of the slide, the starting your yard at gmail.com. Next slide. If you stay for the entire presentation, which I hope you will, there will be a follow up email from Zoom that contains a certificate that can be redeemed at the Wild Ones plant sale in May. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Jim Kleinwachter. Jim is a well-known member of the staff of the Conservation Foundation because he's the program director for conservation at home. This program assists people making changes to their landscape that help retain and cleanse water and create more habitat for wildlife. The highly prized conservation at home sign in your yard signals cooperation with nature's way. Jim has visited hundreds of properties to do evaluations and provide assistance. He is extremely knowledgeable about how to move forward from wherever you are in your changing your landscape to be more equal, eco-friendly. In tonight's session, Jim will show you a variety of native plants that grow in full sunlight, where there are six hours or more of direct sun, and help you think about what establishing a prairie garden requires. He'll also talk about the fact that there are native plant solutions for the different kinds of conditions you may have in your yard, sun, shade, wet, or dry. There will be time for questions and answers after his presentation. And now I turn it over to Jim Kleinwachter. Thank you, Roland. Did it cover there? Are you seeing my screen or no? We are see seeing you. We see you. Okay, I'm trying to get it to convert. If you go out of screen sharing and use Alt F5, that should. It's not letting me screen share. There you go. Right this second. Better. How's that? Looks good. Yeah, good. Okay. 
Well, welcome everybody. And um, we have a little different here if you read the Tell Me book, um, because we have some programs, including the Wild Ones organization and what we do at the Conservation Foundation that bring it a little bit further. So you could read a book, but I'm not certain, or I was fairly certain that that wouldn't be enough. And we are working together to provide more help, more plants, more um, engagement, so that you don't think of it as a good idea, but you think of it as something that I want to do. Our main office is in Naperville at the McDonald Farm. You're welcome to come out and visit it. The Wild Ones could sponsor something as a group, or you can individually get a hold of me at the end of the program. There'll be my email. 60 acres permanently protected, and we grow our 49 acres of organic food. The farm dates back to the 1870s, but we've upgraded with all these green infrastructure, solar panels, wind turbines, a green roof, two different types of rain collection, rain barrels, you name it, you can see it all on one site. And why I am pushing this is that 95% of the property in Illinois is private property. So we can't think that the forest preserves are going to take care of everything for us. We have to connect together with our businesses, park districts, homeowners associations, schools, churches, everybody has to be involved in the conservation practices. And there's some beautiful books, this one by Stephen Kellert, and I love this quote. The picture there on the bottom left, I'm hiking on the Appalachian Trail, I guided my son to his first big muskie. When we get outside, we have these memories and times that we've spent, and these are really what it's all about. So part of it is it's not just good for the birds and butterflies, but it's good for us. We are animals and nature helps us cope. There is a whole movement called Nature Rx where people are going outside to connect to nature. And the thing about it is, you know, you may plan a trip to Yellowstone. I'm going to go down to the Gulf of Mexico, but those are rare trips and they're costly. And we have to be able to nurture ourselves and get to our natural spot quicker than that. And yes, you could go to the forest preserve a few miles away, but how often do you even get there? So having some of these in our yard where we can relax and have a moment of nature is very important to us. This quote and um, book by Bromfield the, the war against our natural assets is what I'm talking about. And we really don't appreciate it. So with the Conservation at Home program, we now have eight different organizations working it through the entire Northwest part of Illinois. It's into Wisconsin, parts of Michigan and Southern Illinois also, where we're helping people implement these practices. What you're seeing, I'll. As we go through the slides, I'll show you some of the pictures. This pink up here is Joe Pye, Joe Pye weed. Uh, these are uh, gray-headed coneflower, retibita, and um, coneflowers and liatris here. Um, so I will tell you further about these plants, but um, as we show pictures, I'll oftentimes I help you identify them. So these are these dots on this map, it's gonna be hard to see, but those are homes and properties that have ecologically friendly landscaping. And you can get a dot on the map by engaging the programs of Wild Ones or the Conservation Foundation or a number of different organizations in Cook Lake McHenry, all the way out to Rockford and so on. Some of the businesses, so we have conservation at home for residential property, and then for non-residential property, we have conservation at work. And these are just some of them. There's over 160 different sites that we've implemented these conservation practices on, on these types of sites. So the idea is to solve problems, accent, increase productivity, sustainability, and 
make that aesthetically pleasing. In the picture on the left, we're growing Monarda below uh, a peach tree. So the idea is that the pollinators come for the Monarda, and then when the peach is blooming, they get pollinated at the same time. Over here, we've got swamp milkweed growing in the low spot where the bridge is going over here. So you've got flowers growing in the, the wet spot, and they're going to increase the pollinator to these other gardens where there's tomatoes growing and other things like that. So the idea is you can make it pretty and functional. And these, a lot of these plants um, here are gonna sustain your garden. So the tomato plant, no matter how good it was, it dies and next year you have to start over again. So having a basis of perennials, long lived perennials can help productivity and aesthetics and bring um, beauty to your yard. We work with park districts. A lot of the people now, you, the ages are not playing ball anymore. So these areas uh, like this one, I'm standing on a bridge and I saw mink that crossed the creek right about here. And these areas are not suitable for ball fields. So why don't we make them more natural and more conducive to wildlife. Jim, these can areas like this for just a second and ask you to hide that little message about uh, with the stop sharing on it. Thank you. This low area here was a, just a mud hole. And by planting these native plants in this low spot, we've created habitat for birds and butterflies, for a rabbit to get away from the mower or a snake, um, other things that could live in these areas like this. And so it's going to bloom and it's gonna solve a problem, whether it be in a backyard or in a park. You can see how some areas that are not gonna be a place where you have a deck or you're not gonna be using it, that we can turn these into native areas. Pretty simple things when I'm talking to people about it. It's containing your water and um, Attracting wildlife, less chemical use, less grass, rebuild your soil, and use the best trees of our area, which we can list them in Ptolemy's book. He lists them down from one, two, three, right down, um, down the list. And oak trees are number one in our region. So we start with the very bottom is that plants are not just decorative things for our yard. They are the essential component of any ecosystem. So any kind of food pyramid, everything starts with plants because plants are the only thing that can take sunlight and turn it into food. So once we understand that plants are life on this planet, the water we drink, the air we breathe, all of that is directly connected through plants. So plants are essential for life. Then the next step would be that it makes a difference what we put out there for plants. This hummingbird in the picture is not coming for a cup of coffee or a, a chat. He's coming for food and we either have it or we don't. So how you landscape will determine what comes and visits your property. And in this case, he's looking at uh, Lobelia cardinalis, the cardinal flower that he is coming to get nectar from. So are we thinking about what we want to attract when we plan our yards. So it all starts back to, um, gets back to ecology and evolution. So on the far left is turf grass and these plants that are in Illinois, you've chosen now to live in Illinois. You bought a house, you're going to school, um, whatever you're doing, you're engaged in Illinois. So why aren't we engaging with the plants of Illinois and what made Illinois uh, a really good place to live in the beginning. And it was, we're in a prairie state. So very clear what was here for thousands of years. And it's very clear what will work well here. And the secret in our area is we have very, I mean, look outside, we have very diverse conditions with sleet and hail and wind and rain and heat, uh, summer sun burning down and winter winds blowing. We have fires that burn across the landscape. We have um, herbivores, cows 
There were buffalo here that would eat these plants. And the way they survived was putting their key components below ground. So keep this in your mind when your neighbor says, well, what, why do you say that that plant's better than this plant? And the answer is evolution. Look at the picture here, courtesy of National Geographic, what a root system of a plant looks like. And so much is further under the soil. So you don't see it and you don't appreciate it. You think if you had a pot of a cone flower and a um, geranium, they'd look the same to you and you'd say, well, they look the same to me. I don't, you know, I don't think there's any difference. And you won't see it because it's below ground. So I'm teaching at College of DuPage and other places. And the key to this is how are we gonna make these plants look pretty? That the number one thing that people are gonna say is that prairie plants are not that nice looking. And I'll show you some pictures both, both ways. But some of the tricks are you clump the plants and make them look organized. Shorter is better than tall. Um, you space between the plants. Sometimes people are using mulch or something between them. You decorate the planting area with logs, rocks, a bird bath, something like that. Um, you may limit the diversity, how many different species you have in, in an area, which makes it easier to identify and weed. And you make paths through the garden so that your mother-in-law can come and walk through the garden. That makes it more um, attractive Maybe you put a bench out there so somebody can enjoy it. And there are a bunch of easy to grow plants that I can start you with, like an A-list of plants. So they're very easy to grow and sustainable. You don't have to worry about them as much. And I show people pictures, the top right, that's prairie smoke, very unique plant. It's a good picture because if there was one of them, they would get lost. But in this clumping, you, you see this pink tuft of fireworks there and it looks very attractive to us. The same thing with the red color will attract where if there was just one, it would get lost in a sea of things. And I'll show you these pictures later on. And I want to show people that they are attractive enough to implement in a front yard situation. We don't have to think that these native plants have to be hidden in the back. There are some things, this was my uh, last house and these common milkweed popped up on the side and, and I didn't want them there. They kind of fall over on the sidewalk. It wasn't a good place for that plant. But my kids screamed at me and said, dad, dad, that's milkweed, that's, that saves the monarchs. And so I did leave some in the back of the planting um, for monarchs. Of course, I had a lot of them in the back and other places, but I also wanted them in the front. So in the backyard, this is a good example of how we created a path. We have rocks, we have logs, recognizable things. So you can see this fence line where typically when you're sitting on your deck, you might be looking at lawn. And this yard, they don't have any backyard lawn. You may not want to go to this extent, but understand how it could be done either in phases or chunks and very pretty things this is coreopsis over here um, we can implement these things and you're much more likely to see finches eating on these native plants and less likely to see geese this type of thing in these landscapes Prairie drop seed is a really nice grass to grow. It's a clumping grass and it's not utilized enough as far as I'm concerned. And it's very easy to grow. Let's get back to that one. Easy to grow. It can grow in the hottest, driest conditions. And um, you can supplement in your planting area. They put drop seed along the sidewalk, but behind here, I think this is uh, the orange milkweed butterfly milkweed and I believe this is see their purple prairie clover over here so you can have some flowering stuff with it but you can see the low profile and you can see down the sidewalk it's not blocking any kind of view shed a very nice planting for these hot dry areas between a sidewalk and a parking lot 
Grasses are nice to supplement. Um, a lot of plantings are a combination of grass and forbs, the flowering plants. Little blue stem is another one we use. Big blue stem gets eight feet tall and kind of um, dominates a planting. So we don't use big blue stem as much or Indian grass. We stay with little blue stem, side oats, maybe switchgrass. And the bottle brush grass is pretty unique on the right that can take some shade. So if you had some partial shade or even deep shade, there are very few grasses that will grow in the shade, but this one will. So I go out to people's homes. And in this case, these people live in Wayne and they wanted me to help them identify what these trees were in their yard. And I said, well, this one is buckthorn. It's from Europe, not a good tree for here. Well, what's this one over here? And I said, that one's honeysuckle. And they kind of looked at me and said, Jim, 90% of our trees are those two. And I said, that's right. So they have what is be considered a, a savanna. And it took them about a year. They called me back and they said, my husband was out there till 11 o'clock at night with a headlight on his hat, cutting and cutting and cutting, and, but they had cleared the woods. And now I could see down below, there was bloodroot and all kinds of wildflowers starting to pop up that had never bloomed. And I told them that the next thing I would suggest is they put up a bluebird house. And they said, Jim, we've been here for 17 years. We've never had bluebirds. And I said, well, you didn't have a savanna. And bluebirds love savannas. And just as I said that, here comes the bluebird. And it flies in and lands on the fence. And she looked at me and she said, did you have that in your car? <laughs> so it does work. And people are happy. I'm able, I didn't do the work there. All I did was steer them in the right direction. 50% of the recent bird count were in these four species. This English sparrow and English starling are both invasive species. They don't even belong in Illinois. And the grackle and the geese are just out of control with their population. These are not the birds you want. The birds you want are our beautiful native birds that have beautiful colors. And there are groupings of these birds that will come for, for a snack, but we have to understand that that is not their true food source. And even the hummingbird, we put out a hummingbird feeder, but it's sugar water and they can't sustain themselves from sugar water. It's like me drinking a Pepsi that it's not going to give me what I need um, overall for good health. Hummingbirds eat ants. All of these birds eat bugs is their main source of protein. They'll eat seeds. This group will eat seeds in the summer and from bird feeders for a supplemental thing. But understanding that this group that you want to come will come by for supplemental feeding there's another group now, this grouping will never come for supplemental feeding. Perhaps maybe the Oriole on the top up here, he might come for some grape jelly or something like that. The rest of these strictly bugs, even the wren, we put up a wren house because they sing so pretty, but they're eating bugs. So all of these birds fly south, the old snowbird story, because there aren't available um, bugs for them now. Many of the birds like this cedar waxwing and the tanager oriole will move on to um, berries in the summer. So if you want some of these birds, we can put in a service berry, viburnums, different berry bushes. And when the berries come ripe, you're much likely, more likely to attract these birds in for the ripe berries. And, you know, again, I think people know what they want and i could try to tell you you want to have diverse nature but really what people want are birds and butterflies it's very hard for me to tell them like this will attract skunks or bees or snakes it, it just uh, so we talk about how to bring birds and butterflies to your yard and the rest come under the radar
So we're watching this butterfly and we don't really see the beetle over there or the rest of the life forms. But understanding that building these habitats will do it for all of them. But, you know, when your granddaughter comes over like mine did, she's not looking at the worms, she's looking at the butterflies. So it's a picture of a blazing star and like a lot of the native plants, there are a variety of, in this family of Leatris. And there are some, there's a Savannah blazing star, there's a marsh blazing star, there is a prairie blazing star, a variety of different types that we can use for dry, wet, partial shade. Um, so it's a matter of we can choose these plants and then find the variety for the site in our yard. This one is very attractive to butterflies. You, People have tried to grow um, butterfly bushes here. They're not native to Illinois. And very oftentimes you're lucky to get two years out of a butterfly bush. And this is the sustainable attracting um, plant that would come back year after year that we could grow instead of something like a butterfly bush. So in the milkweed, this is probably my favorite one. It's a low growing milkweed, very attractive, very pretty. It likes it dry and it's just underplanted as far as I'm concerned for landscaping. The color is just amazing. It brings in all kinds of butterflies to eat uh, nectar from it and it is a host plant for the monarch. This is a planting we did in Lyle, right by the plane, uh, train station, the police station, and high traffic area. This area flooded every year. And we put in this, this is the swamp milkweed, the thin leaf. And even in the middle of downtown Lyle, we have monarchs that utilize this plant. This yellow is Zizia aurea the golden alexander so you can see how we've added color the water no longer puddles here and we even have monarchs utilizing an area in the middle of an urban site here's the botanic name for the swamp milkweed very easy to grow it doesn't get out of control and very sweet um, smelling flowers and it can grow in a variety of conditions. It can grow dry, it can grow wet, it can grow right in the edge of water, like underwater. It can um, take some shade. So very easy to grow in wide conditions. The world milkweed is not as much of a showy plant. The flowers, even though they look pretty showy here, are not that um, show stopping, but it's a very nice plant for uh, it's low, it's 18 inches maybe, and it is attractive to the monarch also. Common milkweed is the one you see all the time, very rich scented flowers. It's very tall, it can get to be six feet, it can fall over, and you see these bumpy pods on, on the plant. Both the butterfly milkweed and the swamp milkweed, the pods are smooth without these little bumps on them. So it's one way to tell the difference between the plants, but this is the one that gets a bad rap that it's invasive or it, I don't want it growing where it's growing. Um, this is the common milkweed and common for a reason. It grows in ditches along farm fields and uh, it grows in a variety of conditions. Very attractive to monarchs. So if you can find a spot that isn't on your front sidewalk like mine was, it's a great plant to put in. And you don't typically have to buy these because you can get the pods or get the seeds. They give them away pretty easy or they just blow in your yard. So I'm trying to gain people's uh, or raise people's awareness and have them look at things a little differently. This is in Naperville. There was a garden area that was looking like this and they wanted to do something about it. Take somebody to make an effort to say, this shouldn't be like this. And we worked with the groups that were there, the garden club, and we made a butterfly garden. And 
We purposely put a walkway in so people can get in there and see the pollinators, smell the flowers blooming, and really sit and enjoy the beauty and all of the senses from the sounds of the birds to the smells and enjoy that area which before was an eyesore. This is the yard in Glen Ellen where they don't have any turf grass in the front yard. And again, you may not want to go to this extent, but they love it. And uh, you can see the orange milkweed that I showed you earlier, the Asclepius tuberosa. And I think it's good to see how they were clumped. So you've got black eyed Susans, you've got the milkweed, and it looks more organized with the walkway coming up here than it would if, if it was just random. This is more of a random planting in a park area. And the plants will somewhat sometimes clump by themselves, but it's more of a mixture in this type of a setting. And some people find this not as attractive or organized. This looks like it's messy. So you might not want this in the front yard, but we can still use those same plants in a different manner and have them front yard pretty. So these people called and they said, well, we don't have any birds, we don't have any butterflies, we have a big problem with water. So the water comes pouring out of the downspout, these two downspouts, and it ends up draining over on the sidewalk and causes a big puddling area here. In the summertime, we get our shoes wet. In the wintertime, it's an ice rink and we have to put salt all over it. The salt kills the grass. We've got dandelions popping up and it's a mess. So how could you improve the look of this, create some habitat and make it better looking? So the big arborvitae that were overgrown covering this beautiful stone were removed. It's not rocket science. Basically the sidewalk had become the lowest point. So the water would pour down onto the sidewalk. Now we've created a low point over here and directed that water to bounce off these rocks and end up going into this direction and then water loving plants are planted over here. They have less lawn to mow. We create a defined edge here. So it looks neat and organized. The plants are in clumps with spacing between them and native trees and shrubs been planted. So you've improved the look. You now have birds and butterflies that will come and less lawn to mow. They still can have their hosta over here. There's, you know, it doesn't have to be 100% native. Backyard situation, they want to have a place for little Johnny to play baseball. And they have a lawn company that comes and sprays. We're going to assume that they're spraying chemical because I don't see a single weed in it. But what they've done is they've created a native buffer on the outside. So that water, the house is always up high and the water is going to run across this lawn. And by having these native plant buffer, you're absorbing that water. You're giving the nitrogen that uh, washes off the grass a place to be absorbed. And up by the house, they have clumpings. There's coneflowers and black-eyed Susans mixed in with non-native sedum. So it doesn't have to be 100% native. This is obedient plant. This is big blue stem, the coneflowers. Uh, this is the native sunflower. So you can see how they've provided function. They want to have Chemlon come. Okay, they've mitigated a lot of that um, problem with having this native buffer. The birds and butterflies still come out here and love it. And it's a beautiful backdrop to the house when they look out from the deck or the patio. There are a lot of beautiful shrubs. This one is my favorite. The service berry and it has berries that are edible like a blueberry so in our area blueberries are very difficult to grow but service berries are easy to grow and the birds just love them um, as spring flowers summer fruit and even in the fall they uh, the leaves have color so in the full sun situations you can even pick things by color like uh, Culver's root on the left or white indigo. Nice 
plants that can be integrated into a garden. This here, I believe is, it's probably um, a wet spot in Lobelia cardinalis over there. There are um, plants for all different varieties that I can help you with. Um, Cone flowers. This one on the left in our our swoop of our um, logo is Dacanacia pallida, and it's the pale purple cone flower. The petals fall back away from the cone, and on the purpurea, the petals stick out more in a fan shape around the cone. You can see the subtle differences um, between them. There's another one here, bottle gentian, very unique color in nature. The Bottles, what they're calling them, are uniquely shaped for pollination to occur. Pagoda dogwood is a small tree that is very attractive to woodpeckers and um, 93 different species of birds. They have fruit that ripen and it gets its name from the umbrella like growth that it grows. So they're like pagoda, like a um, Japanese uh, umbrellas that they would have. Very pretty understory, small flowering tree. So if you looked at what you have, many, this is among the top plants that we see in the landscape. And all you have to do is Google them to find out where they came from. Something like a lilac, not native. Um, Roses, not native. So when we bring these non-native plants here, it's not that they, they aren't pretty, but they don't have function. They're not adapted to our climate and our birds and bugs don't associate with them. So you're not going to see daylilies loaded with bees and pollinators. They just don't, they see it as um, an inert, inert thing. So it just sits there. Grass has zero wildlife value. And I talked about the buckthorn being actually invasive. So any of your favorite plants or things that you have around your yard a lot, like uh, there's a native sedum, but a lot of the sedum that you have is non-native. And it's not, again, it's not that it's bad. It's just understanding that it's just decorative. It doesn't have environmental function. So I try to, you know, gently nudge people into some of the other pretty plants that we can use in our yards. Uh, many of these could could be uh, the, the cardinal flower, turtle head, and iris are water loving plants. The blazing star comes in wet or dry. Bluebells are one that will take shade, very pretty. They'll take wet area or dry. Coreopsis is a dry one, but so pretty and attractive to birds and butterflies. It's um, Name is tick seed, very attractive to um, finches. And back to the milkweed, a variety of different kinds of milkweed we can choose. Some have pink flower, white flower, orange flower. And the grass is not doing anything for us. And it's a monoculture of one species of thing. And it, what it's done in our area is attracted geese and they stay now all year round. So this isn't a good place to fish. If you were a fisherman, you wouldn't want to put a blanket down here and have a picnic. You know that this is covered with goose poop. It's probably been treated. I don't see any dandelions. So there's probably chemical in this grass and it's not good for humans. It's not good for other wildlife. And the goose poop is here. You've got erosion going into the lake that people are walking around or if your house is up here and is this can I talk you out of this and talk you into something else when you see the damage that happens with turf without the root systems and what can happen and what things could look like if it was naturalized so instead of the geese the geese will not be here because they're afraid of um, the tall plants they can't see the coyote or the dog that could be running up on them so they would just avoid this area instead of the geese you might have a heron and you have crayfish and frogs and 
the bass will come closer to the shoreline because they're looking for those um, food species. And I do these presentations for the homeowners so they, they are acceptable to having these native plantings along the edge and understanding that their son can still run down here and fish. And even if he tramples these plants, there used to be buffalo trampling the prairie and it's not gonna hurt them. So we can live with nature. We've been doing a, a lot of it wrong. I used to sell fertilizer. This is 32 is nitrogen and this is phosphorus and potash. Heavy, heavy load of, nat of nitrogen. And you paid $50 for this bag of fertilizer and your grass can't even handle it. If you put this on in the summertime, you'll burn the grass and kill it. So they don't teach us the right thing. You want a healthy lawn. You don't want this overloaded nitrogen on your grass to begin with. And it has very little root system. You've all bought sod and seen you come home with roots that are half an inch thick. So does that make us, that makes sense? Is it that pretty? And it's covering the United States. The green are states that have primarily grass. The states that don't, they're mountainous states, very sparsely populated states, um, or loaded with corn, soybeans, and wheat in these states uh, out west. The rest of them have adopted grass as the number one in covering their entire state. Does that make a lot of sense when it's unproductive, doesn't give us broccoli to feed the poor, it's not pretty as such, and it does nothing for wildlife. $40 billion spent last year on lawn care alone, and it's considered biologically dead. So if I showed you a picture, left or right, which one's prettier? That orange is the milkweed, and we're looking at cone flowers and that prairie drop seed grass. Um, the left is browning out in the middle of a drought, and the right side is in full bloom. These plants can hold water from May, and they're blooming in July when it's bone dry. So does it make sense that if you were walking here with your grandson, where would he be looking? Where would the butterflies be? And yet, what do we cover most of our yards with? Parks, forest preserves, areas, um, walkways and things across the state is primarily this surface. We've created products like this metal mix that are meant to change the idea of turf. It's a lower profile with a lot of forbs, the flowering plants in them. And this is the sample one we have at the McDonald farm. Ours is 25 feet long wide and 1400 lineal feet along a regional bike trail. I sold it to the toll road authority and they're putting it on, this is called the front slope. And I don't want it, it's filled with rocks, broken car parts and salt. But the back slope is interesting to me. This used to be a ditch full with water. When these native plants got in here, the, the water goes down, so it's not available to mosquitoes to nest in or um, lay eggs. This white is penstemon digitalis. It's the heart medicine. You've heard of the digitalis um, cardiac drug. It's made from this plant. Very pretty early spring. This must be like probably late April or May when this plant blooms. So we made a garden at the farm and uh, that's me on the right. These rocks are going to cover this mat. So where the downspout comes out, we've sloped it to this lower area. The water loving plants are gonna be down here. The dry area is gonna be up here. Notice the air conditioner in the next picture, it'll be hidden. These rocks are gonna go over this uh, rubber mat. So the mat is there to direct the water away from the house and not into the basement. The rocks slow the water down and let it trickle into here. And then we have uh, a rain garden in the wet area and we have a prairie up at the top. This is spiderwort. This is again that penstemon digitalis. Up here is the prairie drop seed. 
And this one popped up in here. This is a yucca. This is the native um, rattlesnake master, yucca folium. So that was interesting one that just popped up on its own in the center of this planting area. Notice that air conditioner unit that's in the back that is now hidden by a viburnum shrub. So again, we don't have to mow here. The dry living plants are up by the sidewalk in full sun. The wet areas in the center and the lower part and the plants can self-select if they didn't want to be here. Uh, they can go over there and it works um, very well in these areas. So that's what I'm trying to do is bring this information to people. What you have more than just the Ptolemy book to kind of get your information. We have a load of brochures and Wild Ones has a lot of talks. We also have talks that you can take a piece of um, and learn your education from. We have handouts that we can attach to emails or mail to you. And I do home visits. So it's, it's an extra step. And we've been working with the wild ones on making those home visits. And many times the wild one um, people have been making the visits with us. So they can, both organizations can come together. And the, uh, Roland talked about the plant sales. There's a variety of other plant sales also besides the wild ones. We have our own and there are continuous ones throughout the year. So if even if you miss the one in May, there are ways that we can help you get plants throughout the year. And then, um, the other slide isn't showing, but I can give you, um, we can have a Roland put my email and office number into the notes and you can get my contact information and I can take questions now. So Nancy or Roland. Oh, yeah, all right, thank you, Jim, for that great presentation. Um, we have a few questions here. So how do you keep the weeds down and what's the best mulch for our area? Um, weeds are going to be a problem, you know, that's just an ongoing thing. Um, so I use newspaper. Oftentimes if I'm doing a new planting, I'll wet the newspaper and put it around my plants. I might plant three plants in a triangle and then newspaper around those plants. You can use wood chips or, um, a variety of different types of mulches. I think you want to use an eco-friendly one and one that would um, work back into the soil. I would not suggest anything like um, oh, white marble or volcanic rock or I even saw at the uh, Flower and Garden Show they were promoting broken glass and under the lights and inside the Navy Pier um, this green glass that had been tumbled it wasn't sharp but they were putting it around their plants and i was like no way would you want anybody that's tried to dig volcanic mulch out of the soil um it's a nightmare so i don't typically put down fabric i prefer cardboard or paper that will degrade and using mulch that is uh, leaf mulch is probably the best thing compost things like that but if you didn't have that, you can use grass clippings. You can use um, a variety of things, but you want something that will degrade and work back into the soil. Okay. Um, another question was, what does plant in clumps mean? Do you plant, right, this is multiple questions. Uh, do you plant multiples of the same plant closer than recommended or is it in the recommended spacing between plants, but with many plants? It would depend on the planting. It definitely is multiple plants of the same species. That is the most key part. So if you were going to buy five new plants, don't buy five different things and put them in because each plant doesn't show up enough, in the, especially in the front yard. If you buy, I would say the typical thing would be three or five of something 
and plant them maybe a little bit closer if you want more of a, a quick, you know, if you're trying to save your money, then planting them farther, eventually they will all fill in. But in the meantime, if you're trying to cut down weeds, plant them closer, or if you want a quicker effect, then you plant them closer. Okay. So are there any native lilies or bulb plants? Um, there is a Turk's cap lily that is orange. So in all the families, there are similar things. Um, a lot of the plants have uh, like bluebells, for example, they don't have a true bulb, it is a corm. So it looks like a, a black charred piece of wood, but you put that in the ground in the fall, like you would a tulip and it sprouts back into the spring. So if you're moving things, a lot of them have um, a clump or a root system underground, but not a true bulb like you'd think with a tulip. Okay. I guess, is there, what's the difference between a corm and a bulb? Is that, because a lot of- uh, it's, it, it's more the shape okay. um, and the way that it looks. So when you think of a bulb, you think of like an onion and there are native onions um, there's nodding wild onion that would have a bulb there, you know, it's not that there aren't any bulbs, but they're not a typical thing for our area. So these corms are, would be a root, a dormant root structure, but instead of being bulb shaped rounded, these corms might be elongated or a different shape. Okay. Cause isn't trout lily, isn't that a bulb? Um, it does have a small bulb and so does, um, oh, what's the other one? Um, spring beauty. Spring beauty, all right. So those are the spring so, ephemerals. Like. Yeah. Some of the spring ephemerals would have a bulb like thing in the nodding wild onion. There's some other ones. There's a few. Yeah. And I guess you don't buy them. Well, I've never seen them in like a store, like, a you know, like you go on buy daffodils in a mesh bag you'd have correct to the plant sale usually and in... right or some of the things like spring beauties and trout lilies i think you buy a seed and you just seed them across now wild ones does a great job of having a fall seed program where people collect the seed and can share it with other people that's a nice program but you can also this time of year buy um the seed online i've been trying to grow um wild leek so the ramps they're called which does form a bulb but you typically buy them um, in a seed form and they grow in the shade and you can harvest them for um, cooking there's a lot of um, pat armstrong wrote a beautiful book about how to use native plants for eating purposes and you know the native americans and there are a lot of people that have have um, done a big studies on how to eat these native plants. So there's a lot of uses for them. I, I focused on aesthetics and birds and butterflies today, but there's no reason why we shouldn't be eating some of these for medicinal purposes and for health. There's a lot of um, wonderful health value in, um, in these plants. Yeah, and somebody actually posted something about uh, the Digitalis purpia, the foxglove in the chat along with your informa contact information. Um, okay, here's another question. Uh, can the roots of the prairie plants adversely harm a septic field? I've seen all kinds of things that show yes and no. Um, in my experience is no, that they have not, um, they're not the type of roots like, uh, oh, the big culprit is willow trees that can get into a root system or, and into piping even and break it open. Um, so the prairie plants, in my opinion, have not caused any problems uh, near or over septic. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I haven't really heard of any issues with those either. Um, which Laetris species is tolerable of shade? The most common one that I use is uh, Leatris scariosa. 
So it's the Savannah liatris. It's a little more hard to find. Um, we get it from Piso out in um, DeKalb County. So um, look for that one if you have some partial shade, you know, some sun, but it'll, you know, it'll take 50-50 sun shade. Okay. And there's, there's a whole nother, we didn't go into it today about shade gardening, but um, you can watch one of the other brochures or the other seminars about shade gardening or contact me and I'll be more than happy to send you a brochure or um, give you information. Okay, here's one related to that kind of, uh, we have uh, Ruth writes, we have a lot of dry shade, some beneath an old mulberry tree and some beneath evergreen trees. Could you recommend two or three natives that might do well? I will go to the Wild Ones native plant sale in May. That's good. Sure. Um, wild ginger is good. Uh, I have bloodroot, jack in the pulpit. I have um, in my dry shade, um, some of my favorites, wild phlox, woodland phlox. Beautiful, beautiful, uh, very colorful, very fragrant plant. Uh, wild geranium is another one that is very colorful and nice for home landscapes. So those would be my top five. Um, and you, some of the things like wild ginger doesn't have a flower, it's more of a ground cover, right. but it works very well with some of the things like bluebells that will come up and bloom and then fall back again. So, um, Bluebells are very versatile. They'll grow in dry and they'll grow in wet. So that's another thing that bring spring color. The, the biggest part of color for those shade areas is going to be in the spring. And then it'll turn to uh, primarily greens in the summer. Okay. Yeah, and I was just thinking there's a lot of places you can see these in nature preserves like Trout Park and Johnson Mound. It's like especially some of these spring ephemerals that you mentioned, and if they're in the shade, those are the ones that would do well in shade. Right, and if you, I mean, the thing we're talking about prairies today, that you have to keep thinking that the sun is the power. Right. And when these spring areas are blooming, they don't have any competition. The leaves are not on the trees. So they get some sun and they get some power and they do their blooming and their seeding and then the trees leaf out and it becomes deep shade and they don't have enough power to generate flowering. So once we kind of understand that a little bit, the flowering is gonna pop in the other parts of your yard where you have sun later on. So the spring area will be your amazing color in the spring. And then out by the garden and the other sunny places, it's going to pop later on in the summer. Right, yeah, good point. Um, which of the grasses you mentioned are easy to grow from seed? Well, it depends how quick you want to go. Uh, a lot of the projects that I showed today, we were not using seed because it takes a long time. That one meadow that I showed you that was 25 feet wide and 1,400 feet long, that was all seeded. But it takes two to three years before you get good plantings from seed. So if you're willing to wait, all of them can be grown from seed. Little blue stem is probably one of the easy ones. Switchgrass is easy. Um, drop seed, a little bit harder, but it certainly can be grown um, from seed. Okay, thanks. Um, and then what is the best way to get rid of buckthorn? Well, Cut it down immediately, especially I tell people that um, the female plants fruit. So if you see the blackberries, that plant needs to go immediately. My, I'm working on my son's yard and there's no way you could cut all the trees down all at once. So we concentrated this year on taking out all the females that were fruiting and got them out. Once you cut them down, then you need to either um, cover that stump there are some um, like uh, you could put a coffee can over it or there are some plastic bags. You know, if you use the black plastic thing and a rubber band or something around the stump, mm -hmm. there are some commercially made um, fabric bags 
that cover the stump on a larger tree that you might cut down or Roundup, Garlon, the, the chemical application to those stumps. Same thing with honeysuckle. Um, if you cut it down, it comes back angry. You cut one down, it comes back as three. If you cut the three, it comes back as six. It's, um, it's a never ending battle unless you treat it somehow. You can cover it with uh, cardboard or something like that and pile things on it if you can get it cut down to the ground level. But chemical or covering of that stump. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions today. We had John Cusack from Haverford Place. Just wanted to acknowledge that you had were a big help in their 55 plus community when they were trying to return their woodlands and wetlands to good health. So they, he wanted to say thank you. And um, Beth also was wondering about um, like nursing homes, if you go out to nursing homes, they would probably sure. enjoy looking at the native plants rather than the expansive lawns that they may have. Absolutely, I'm working with uh, Windermere. Um, there's there's a number of nursing homes and retirement centers that I've worked on. Um, what's the big one that's up on um, North Avenue? Uh, Windsor Manor. Hmm. Churches, schools, libraries. If the library wants to put in a butterfly garden, we've worked with a number of libraries and certified some of them with uh, the program. And, and again, the nice thing is we want you to join the program, but you don't have to. It doesn't have to cost you anything to do it. And we do these consultations where I come out and give you some advice and that's completely free. So it's, it's, it's a nice service that we're able to provide as a not-for-profit and I just urge people to take advantage of it. And we now have um, Jessica Mino that works with us, that she lives in um, in the area up in Kane. And between the two of us, we're able to um, provide these visits. Great. And somebody had uh, recommended also going over, was wondering if you worked with schools. Yes, absolutely. I think you had a, actually a slide with schools and things like that. All we try to do is, you know, Whoever, you know, if it's a library, we need the librarian or the groundskeeper, somebody who says, yes, that sounds good. I want to come there at school. You need the principal's permission, church. You need one of the clergy to sign on to the, the idea that they're open to suggestions. That's all that I look for is that somebody there is saying, yeah, that sounds like an interesting idea. Let's look into it. Okay. Right. Uh, and like I mentioned before, your information is in the chat for those that want to look it up. Uh, just go down your chat in your Zoom session. You can get Jim's information. So thanks again, Jim. And I'd also like to thank again, Gail Bourne Library for hosting these events and publicizing this community read. And also don't forget that uh, you can pick up Doug Tellamy's book at Al's Cafe and Arabica Cafe in uh, Elgin. And thanks to the Wild Ones for actually making a donation so that you can purchase these books at almost a 50% discount from the retail price. Um, and I think that is all that we have. On, a lot of people say thank you. Um, don't forget there's plant sales coming up. There's the Wild Ones. One in May, the information is out there. You can go to startingyouryard.com for information on that. And also, as Jim mentioned, there's a lot of other native plant sales that are in the area. Thank yeah. you for hosting. Yeah, and thank you. Have a, thanks for attending and have a great rest of your day.